Well, good morning. It's Friday, and it's Bruce Williams. So it's time for another Gross Path Challenge. This one is number 16. As I do at the beginning of all of my lectures, I want to thank my friends and colleagues who have provided me their images over the years, either through online collections or directly, which allow me to put my lectures and these little quizzes together. Go ahead and get out your pens and your papers. Let's have a little fun. Question number one comes to us from a great image by Dr. Tom Cecier of Virginia Tech. And this is a suckling piglet, two days old. I would like a morphologic diagnosis and two possible causes. Give yourself some time, think about it, and I'll be back in just a second. Okay, time's up. First thing, look at the wrinkling of the smooth muscle in the ilium. That's a normal finding in many pigs. Don't get, uh, don't get tricked by that. The lesion that we're looking for is right here. This is the colon. This is mesocolonic or mesocolonic edema. And it's seen in two conditions in the pig. It's been well documented in about 60% of suckling piglets infected with Clostridium difficile, or should I say, from which the toxin associated with Clostridium difficile has been recovered, because most piglets have it, but you have to recover the toxin and see signs of the disease to diagnose that particular condition. A second cause in slightly older animals would be the production of a shigatoxin by enterogenic E. coli, also known as edema disease, which causes edema throughout the body in areas in which the global lacil ceramide receptors are in high concentrations. The mesocolon is certainly one, the wall of the stomach, uh, certain areas of the skin, including the eyelids, the larynx, which gives these animals a particular odd squeal, and unfortunately, some areas of the brain which result in cerebral edema and death. Great lesion, mesocolonic edema. Okay. Question number two. An old case from the National Zoo. This is tissue from a duck. I want you to name the likely condition and the likely target organ. Okay, time's up. We're looking at the gizzard or the ventriculus of this duck. And this is a common problem in zoos in the US, especially with waterfowl, because people just can't seem to walk by a pool of water without throwing a little bit of money in it for good luck. Someone threw a American penny into this, and there's lots of them all over the zoo. And uh, the ducks see them, they're shiny, and they gobble them up and swallow them. And people think that pennies are made of copper, but they're not. Uh, for many years, co pennies in the U.S. have been made by zinc, which is a much cheaper alloy. They're overlaid by a very thin veneer of copper. <clears throat> Both alloys could have, elements would have problems in the animal. But what we see in the condition that I'm looking for in this case is zinc toxicity once the uh, copper has been digested and worn away, and the animal will be poisoned by zinc. This usually causes uh, necrosis of the pancreas. So pancreas is target organ, zinc toxicity in this case, and it's seen in a wide range of animals, mammals, birds. Eating zinc is a very, very bad thing to do. Okay, slide number three. Dr. Mario Cagnotti, the University of Milan. And this is a nude mouse. I would like a morphologic diagnosis and a cause. Okay, time's up. I hope you've been keeping up with some of my other lectures. This one was just recently covered in the lectures of the diseases of skin of mice. It's a very characteristic condition as seen in nude mice. Okay, the issue is not that the animal has no hair. The issue is that nude mice are immunodeficient. And these particular animals develop a 
multifocal coalescing hyperkeratotic dermatitis. And an organism that likes to infect, a lipophilic organism that likes to live in this hyperkeratotic crust is Carinobacterium bovis. Some cases have been associated with Staphylococcus xylosis, but Carinobacterium bovis is the case and the organism that is most often recovered from these animals. These animals uh, exhibit, uh, can exhibit severe insensitive water loss through the defective desquamation of the skin and can actually absolutely die from dehydration in these conditions. Okay, uh, crusty mice, Carinobacterium bovis. This is tissue from a chicken. How about a morphologic diagnosis and a cause? Okay, great picture. Could be a little better, but it's an old picture, so I'm very happy that at least I have one copy. And you have to look pretty closely. Uh, hopefully everybody recognizes that we're in the air sacs. The air sacs are markedly thickened. They're covered with a catarrhal exudate. So this is a multifocal to coalescing catarrhal air sacculitis. And these little structures, if you look very closely at them, you'll see these little legs. And these are air sac mites in the name of the air sac mite. And the chicken is Cytodites nudus. And just the walking around, living in here, uh, is enough to cause you know, some irritation of the air sacs. They will get sort of uh, uh, opalescent. There will be sort of a mucousy exudate, and this is uh, air sac mites in a chicken. Slide number five is tissue from a blank. I mean, Dr. Williams, I'm not even going to give you the, uh, the species on this, because I think that certain organs, certain, certain species, you should be able to pick up just on visual inspection. So it's tissue from a blank. And I would like a blank, the blank, and name two other blanks. That's a little that's a little much. How about just tissue from a blank, give me a morphologic diagnosis, a cause, and name two other lesions in this animal, potential lesions. Okay. Time's up. Hopefully most of you recognize this as the liver from a pig. Pigs have very, very prominent fibrous connective tissue around each lobule. Now, there are a lot of changes going on here. The liver is sort of an orangey color instead of the traditional you know, red, well-vascularized color that we usually see. So it makes this uh, fibrous connective tissue even more prominent. The morphologic diagnosis will explain why it's even more prominent, and this is diffuse massive hepatic necrosis. If you look in the center of these lobules, you will see that they're extremely pale. There's necrosis in here. Sometimes the entire lobule is necrotic, and the fact that it is so orange here suggests it's either all necrotic or maybe this very whitish orange in the middle is the necrotic part, and then the very periportal rim is just really sick. And sick hepatocytes tend to accumulate fat without the ability, without the energy reserves to be able to complex it to lipoproteins and resecrete it. So sick hepatocytes, if they're adding in here, probably would be swollen with a lot of lipid, giving it an orange color. When I say massive, don't confuse massive with diffuse. Diffuse means there is necrosis throughout the entire section. Massive refers to the pattern of injury or the pattern of necrosis within the hepatic lobule. So, you know, we have central lobular, central lobular and mid-zonal, which often go hand in hand, and periportal. And in the rare cases, in the rare diseases in which necrosis hits the entire lobule, from the central lobular area all the way out to the periportal area, that is when we ter use the term massive necrosis. And that's what goes on in this particular condition in pigs, which is caused by a lack of dietary vitamin E. 
It is known as hepatosis dietetica. And oftentimes the animal will be on a high fat diet as well. There are a number of conditions that are seen in hepatosis dietetica, usually a disease of young pigs and other lesions or diseases that you may have may have written down here which would be perfectly acceptable would be white muscle disease, necrotizing myocarditis, or a condition known as exudative diesthesis which results in endothelial damage and edema and hemorrhage in multiple organs throughout the body. It's not common usually to see them all together but when we think about vitamin D I want you to be thinking about the range of diseases that it could happen. Vitamin E is sorry, vitamin E. Vitamin E is not the deficiency is not the only thing that could cause this type of massive necrosis. There are a number of other toxins which could do something like this in a pig. Uh, some very classic ones attesting to the omnivorous habits of the pig, like clay pigeon toxicity, cockleburr toxicity. Uh, and a number of others. Okay, slide number six is from a rat. Let's make this one easy. Give me the name of this condition. Okay, time's up. This is a common, common disease in rats, seen in all sorts of strains. Uh, just about any inbred strain of rat will show some degree of this over life. It may start as early as, as three or four months if you're really attuned to looking for the lesion. It gets progressively worse over the course of the animal's life, often resulting in renal failure in animals at the age of 18 months to two years. The condition is known as chronic progressive nephropathy. In this condition, there are lesions in all segments of the nephron, which would include the glomerulus, the tubules, and the interstitium. They are all intertwined. It's very unusual in an old rat to see, uh, not to see this particular condition. It is uh, a lesion that causes great consternation uh, in, in scientists who are looking at chronic renal studies in rats chronic progressive nephropathy, the prototypical renal disease in laboratory rodents. All laboratory rodents, as they get older, their kidneys get shot, but nowhere as close to end stage as in the rat with chronic progressive nephropathy. Rats, like most other species, should have nice, rich, red-colored kidneys Cats have a lot of fat in their kidneys. They tend to be gold. Pigs tend to be a little lighter than others. But the kidney of the rat should be just as rich and brick colored as anyone else's. When you see the golden, lumpy, bumpy kidney in a rat, you know that's going to be chronic progressive nephropathy. Let's look at slide number seven. Use all the information that is available to you. And this is tissue from a dog. I would like for you to give me a morphologic diagnosis for this lesion. Okay, time's up. We're looking at a lesion on the side and the underside of the tongue. It is raised, it is rough. It is somewhat greenish. And the breed of dog is a husky or a malamute or a sled dog, which gives you a little additional information here that might help you get to the correct diagnosis. When we look at something like this, first thing I always think about in just about any breed of dog is just granulation tissue because I see a lot of lesions associated with granulation tissue underneath the tongue of a dog. A dog jams a stick in there or gets a cut in there. And with the constant moistness, the constant movement, <clears throat> It really retards healing, and you can get a lot of granulation tissue down there. And that's the majority of what we see underneath the tongue of dogs and cats. Every once in a while, you'll get a tumor, especially in cats with squamous cell carcinomas, or an eosinophilic granuloma in the cat, which can show up as a either proliferative or ulcerative lesion in the mouth under the tongue. Now, we all know that dogs don't get eosinophilic granulomas, except for sled dogs. 
Slid dogs will develop eosinophilic granulomas in the mouth, especially around the tongue. And when you get a lot of eosinophils together, um, they tend to reflect, refract light and you get a greenish discoloration. This is everything that we have here. This is an eosinophilic granuloma. And when you see sled dogs and lesions in the oral cavity, it has to be one of your top rule outs. Okay, this is also tissue from a dog. Let's be a little bit more verbose. Show me what you know. And I want the pathogenesis of this lesion. Okay, probably should have taken about, uh, about 90 seconds for that one. When I go for pathogenesis, I like to see like four or five steps separated, separated by arrows. It doesn't have to be written in complete sentences, but these are basic concepts which let the grader know that you are familiar with the sequence of events in the development of this lesion. The last of the steps is traditionally the morpho morphologic diagnosis of the lesion that you're looking at. So, my last step for this one, we're looking at the liver of a dog, is very nodular. My morphologic, my canmorphologic diagnosis for cirrhosis in the dog, and I don't like the term cirrhosis because if you ask 10 pathologists, what is cirrhosis? They're going to give you 10 different answers. Everybody sort of has an idea, but the one that I like, and I, feel free to use it, is macronodular hepatocellular regeneration with fibrosis. And then at the end of that, I'm going to put cirrhosis just in parentheses so everybody knows that I know what I'm talking about and they know what I'm talking about. And that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing macronodules. They are regenerative and they're surrounded by fibrosis. Let's go through the pathogenesis. First step, animal undergoes a low-grade hepatic intoxication, something that is toxic to hepatocytes that will kill hepatocytes, but is not going to kill the dog. They're not getting a dose that's high enough to kill the dog, so they're getting a little bit every day. Maybe this is a dog on anticonvulsant therapy. Maybe this is a dog that's eating moldy food, getting a little bit of aflatoxin, just something that injures those hepatocytes, and a couple of them blip out of existence every day. Okay, so this subclinical hepatic necrosis. Now, what happens, second step, is... The liver is going to regenerate. Hepatocytes under these conditions have the ability to regenerate markedly, but the other side of that coin is at the same time there's transmission of transformation of edo cells into fibroblasts which start laying down fibrous connective tissue. So it's a race. Okay, you have these expanding nodules of regenerating hepatocytes and then around the edges you have all these fibroblasts laying down fibrous connective tissue. And this is what gives us this repetitive macronodular pattern. Okay? Unfortunately, that macronodular, that, that fibroblast proliferation is going to damage the normal traffic of blood and bile through the liver, and it's going to contract. Okay? And that's why these animals go into liver failure. You will also see other changes associated with improper blood flow, like portal hypertension, and maybe this animal is going to open up some, some vascular anastomoses to allow blood to get around the liver. Okay, so my pathogenesis is very simple. This is low-grade hepatic intoxication, leading to subclinical hepatic necrosis, leading to concurrent proliferation of hepatocytes and transformation of edo cells into fibroblasts, leading to macronodular hepatocellular regeneration with fibrosis. Okay, this is repeated over and over. In dogs especially, you'll see this macronodular pattern. In large animals like cattle and horses, you don't tend to get these nodules of regenerating hepatocytes. You get the fibrosis and the entire liver tends to get very hard and shrinks in size, but you won't see these nodules of proliferating hepatocytes. Okay, only two more slides. This is tissue from a budgeriger or a parakeet. 
I would like a morphologic diagnosis and a cause. Okay. Time's up. A little bit of it's out of focus, but it's a great picture. And we're looking at a diffuse, severe, hyperkeratotic, it's all crust here, hyperkeratotic pododermatitis, one of the major causes of hyperkeratotic dermatitis in birds, chickens, budgerigars, is infection with mites. And the particular mite that we're looking at is Nematocoptes pili. P-I-L-A-E. It's Latin for dart. If you see this in a chicken, it's a different species. It's Nematocoptes mutans. The lesion is the exact same thing. There's a tremendous proliferation of crust, a very thick crust in which the mite lives on the non-feathered skin. Skin of the feet. You can also see it on the face, around the sear. So Nematocoptes pili. Remember, hyperkeratotic dermatitis. If you take a lot of these challenges, you'll find that there are a lot of skin lesions that will cause hyperkeratosis. The ones that I really think about are mites in the skin, sarcoptic mites or nematocoptes. A lot of them will do it because they live in the skin they, and they drop waste products and they move around and they lay eggs and the skin's going to try and protect itself. One of the things it can do is... Uh, alters desquamation and form a crust. Another thing that often causes hyperkeratotic dermatitis is dermatophytosis. So always think about those two. And we've already seen uh, we've already seen a bacterial infection by Coronabacterium bovis in this particular challenge that causes hyperkeratosis. Okay, well let's finish this challenge and begin our weekend with one more slide, and this is tissue from a sheep, I would like a morphologic diagnosis and a cause. Okay, time is up. We're obviously looking at the lungs from a sheep. We have a large multifocal coalescing area on both sides. It's sort of whitish. It looks like cells have been added. When I look at the, when I look at the lungs of sheep, there are a number of conditions um, that you can think of, but but the one that people have the most pictures of, if you just look at the number of pictures that people have, are two conditions. You have lentiviral pneumonia, or ovine progressive pneumonia, or Marsh's progressive pneumonia, which is a, uh, a lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia, which tends to affect the entire lung diffusely, and the, the lungs do not collapse. The other one that people really get a lot of pictures of is a condition known as Yagsicti, um, the morphologic diagnosis is a bronchiolar adenocarcinoma. This is what this particular picture is, and to my eye, they don't involve the entire lung. They look like lymphomas because we're adding a lot of extra cells. We're adding a combination of neoplastic cells. These are, these are bronchiolar adenocarcinomas. People just call them pulmonary adenocarcinomas now, and that would be a perfectly fine morphologic diagnosis for this. But they tend to arise from the cells of the bronchiolar rim, and so you get this tremendous papillary proliferation of those, and they're often surrounded and infiltrated by alveolar macrophages in there to clean up the tremendous edema that these tumors secrete. They're tough to take a picture of because you put the lungs down and then all this fluid comes out and you have to keep pulling up the lungs, you have to keep mopping up the fluid. These animals actually, when they're clinically affected, um, the disease Yagsikti is, is Dutch for driving sickness because these animals would get really sick when you would move them from one field to another. And they would be the ones that were lagging behind because they simply can't breathe. There's so much fluid in their lungs. And then if you get to the end of the drive, you pick them up by their hind limbs, and all this fluid would pour out of their nose. It's just, just not a whole lot of fun to look at. And so these are really moist, moist, weepy, tumors. So we're looking at a combination of a tremendous cellular infiltrate, both neoplastic and alveolar macrophages, and edema, which give them a very characteristic appearance. To me, it does look like a tumor, whereas progressive pneumonia will just look like a diffuse interstitial pneumonia. Well, I hope you picked up a couple tips. I hope this was helpful, or at least I hope it was challenging or fun.
any of those would be fine with me. Thank you for your attention. I hope you have a great weekend.